Welcome to the New City Church Podcast. My name is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and we're thrilled that you've joined us for this week's message. Every week at New City, we invite people to experience new life through trusting Jesus, learn a new way of honoring God, and walk in a new purpose of making disciples. If you're looking for more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. Good morning, New City Church. I don't know about you guys, but it feels like summertime today. <laughs> Last week, I felt like I was going to die. You know, we moved out here two years ago, and I feel like I remember it being cold, um, and I remembered snow. I didn't remember that I hated snow as much as I do now. Um, but man, I'm so happy to be with you guys today. Um, we are in the middle of a series called Take Care. So I'm going to ask you to stand up on your feet for the reading of God's Word. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn them on or flip them to the book of Romans, chapter number 12. We'll find the verse that kind of anchors all of this together. And then we'll jump over to the Old Testament and read a quick verse there. Do me a favor. Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor... You look good today. Come on, fellas, this is your opportunity. She might be in the room. She ain't want to talk to you. Looking for somebody else, say, other neighbor, I'm happy to be sitting with you today. Hey, I'm just in the business of throwing alley-oops, man. I'm just trying to help somebody find their person. (laughs) The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Roman, and um, here's what he says. He says, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So we'll put a bookmark right there, and then we'll jump to the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Your translations may read a little differently. This is from the ESV. It says this, above all else. Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Let us pray. Father, you're so good. You're so good, God. Lord, today we have people in the building, people tuning in online, God, and I believe that they're walking in today expecting for you to move, expecting to feel your presence, God. I'm praying for those in the room that want to see breakthrough happening in their lives, God. I'm praying for those in the room that have some needs, that have been distractions, God. I pray you keep us focused in this time. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. You can have a seat. So There's a couple of ways that you can categorize the different books in the Bible, but for the most part, like a bird's eye view, you'll notice that it's divided into two major sections. You have the Old Testament that was written in ancient Hebrew, and then you have the New Testament, which is written in ancient Greek. Here's the thing about the Old Testament and ancient Hebrew. The ancient Hebrews didn't have a distinct term for the word Mind. There was no terminology for that. Um, by the time you get to the, to the New Testament, this concept of the mind plays such an important role in, in, in understanding a person. But in the Old Testament, there is no separate word that could be used for a man's mind. So what the English translators used to do, or did rather, they would supply other words depending on the context of the verse. So you'll find words like soul, spirit, or heart. So as you read throughout the scriptures, you come to find that these words, soul, spirit, heart, thoughts, are so closely connected and related This means that the widely held distinction that the mind is the seat in which thinking happens and the heart is the seat in which feelings happen is actually a foreign alien concept to the scriptures that we read. For example, Proverbs 23 verse 7, for as he thinks in his heart, stop right there. 
I don't know about you, but I don't think here. I think up here. Now that we're advanced in science, we understand that thinking doesn't happen in the heart. It happens in the mind. It all starts up here in your head. Your feelings, emotions, thoughts, actions all start because of your mind. But you know who's the best Bible interpreter there is in the world? Jesus. Look at what Jesus did when he was asked by the Pharisees which was the greatest commandment. For you to understand this, let's first read the verse he was referencing in Deuteronomy. Let's put that verse up, chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You jump and fast forward to the New Testament when he's asked which is the greatest commandment. He's quoting this verse, but watch what he does. Verse 29, Mark 12, 29. Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. I love this because it shows us that God is always ahead of the game. Even in these ancient writings, we see that God is showing us that the mind is what controls the person. A couple of years ago, I stumbled upon this article, and I'm sure probably many people have read it or have heard it at some point. But the article read like this. It said there was a man that went to India and he noticed a group of elephants that were tied, tethered to a tree by this small little rope. And he was just so confused because he's seeing this giant of a beast and they're not moving from the tree. And all that's keeping them held to this tree is this tiny little rope. So he obviously had questions and he asked around. And what he came to learn was that they do that once like they're born, right? So when they're little baby calves, they would tether these little babies to these trees. And when they were young, the tree was strong, the rope was strong enough to keep them tethered to the tree. But then as they continue to grow up, if they want to keep them in place, all they have to do is tether them to that tree, even though in order to break away from that tree, all they had to do was move and they would break free. This is what psychologists is calls learned helplessness. And I feel like it's the perfect illustration for many of us today. We think that we're stuck and so we don't even attempt to move. It all starts up here. If the elephant understood its inner strength, if the elephant understood that this little old rope can't keep me tethered to this tree, he would understand that he's free. And for a lot of Christians, they profess the name of Jesus, they give their lives to Jesus, but they're still tethered to this tree. Because you still think you're in bondage to something that God has set you free from. This is why it's imperative for us to take care of our minds. Look to your neighbor and say, take care of your mind. So let's go back to Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. Your thoughts reveal who you are. Your thoughts, the way that you think, impacts the person you are and are becoming. This is why negative people that continue to have negative thoughts will continue to be in negative places and negative situations next to other negative people. Try to say that 10 times fast. And I want to be clear, this is not the law of attraction. I don't see that in scripture. But what I do see is that you don't necessarily attract things with your thoughts, but the principle that scripture teaches is that you are attracted to the things that you think about. Because your thoughts will always show you where you're heading. If you have not changed the way that you think, you won't change the way that you act. If you won't change the way that you act, it will be impossible for you to change your situation. This is why if you're convinced that you're hopeless, even when hope is made available to you, 
you'll feel like it's impossible, impossible for you to hold on to hope because your mind has already been made up about your current situation. But you have to take care of your mind by going back to what God has said. I want to ask you the question this morning. What does God say about you? So many of us have such a low view or too much of a high view of ourselves. It's humbling and then it's also encouraging to go back to what the scriptures have to say about us. What does God have to say about your situation this morning? I know for some people it may look hopeless, but what does God have to say about hopelessness? I know the situation may look impossible, but you know what? I'm reminded by a story in the gospel where an angel comes to a virgin woman and says, Hey, Mary, you're about to give birth to the Savior of the world. And this virgin woman has a question. She's like, but how can that be? Because I've never been with a man. And the angel says, well, I'm paraphrasing here. Well, I know you need the guy and the girl to do the thing, to get the thing. But even though it may appear that you're missing a very important variable, you still have the most important one of all, which is God himself. And then what does the angel say to Mary? Nothing is impossible with God. Change the way that you think, change the way that you act, change your situation. You change the way that you think by going back to what he says. Psalms chapter one, verses one and two. Blessed is the man, peep this. Oh, that was my New York. I'm sorry. Peep this. Watch this. <laughs> Blessed is the man <laughs> who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Leave this up. How does one receive counsel? One receives counsel with words. Words affect thoughts, right? Thoughts then affect actions. Because then it goes and says, nor stands in the way of sinners. And then actions affect decisions. Nor sits in the seat, a symbol of decision making, of scoffers. And then we get to verse 2. But his delight is in the law, the scriptures of the Lord. And on his law, on his scriptures, he meditates day and night. I am not a psychologist, a therapist, a professional counselor. All I am is a preacher of God's word. But allow me to make a bold claim this morning. I am fully convinced mental health has to start here. I'm not saying that all those other things aren't helpful. Helpful. Get the help that you need, but it's all out of order if you're seeking that kind of help before you're seeking the help of God. Blessed is the person who meditates on his words day and night. And this meditation, this isn't like a new age terminology that, 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 that some of us thinks it is. It's not just sitting down and, and just thinking about random things. No, this picture for meditation in the scripture is that of a beast enjoying its meal, taking it slow, enjoying every bite of it, salivating over it. This is what the scriptures are telling us to do. It's saying, don't just read your Bible verse for the day. Think about it. Chew on it. See it transform you from the inside out. Meditate on it day and night. Take care of your mind by guarding it against lies. Look to your neighbor and say, watch out for them liars. Listen, the story of the Bible starts off with the creation of the world and the fall that led to sin and death and brokenness. The creation of the world started off with the source of life and truth, which was God and his word. He said, let there be and there was. The fall started with deception and lies. The serpent goes up to Eve and says, did God really say that you can't eat fruit from that tree? Eve responds and says, yeah, he said we can't eat from that tree or touch, you know, anything from that tree. And then watch what he does. He goes, uh, she goes, because if we eat from that tree, then we're going to die. And then the serpent says, you won't surely die. 
This is Genesis chapter 3. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What is this serpent doing to Eve? (laughs) He's attacking her thoughts. He's manipulating her beliefs. He's challenging her conviction. Can I just say, that's not, it's not even in my notes. Watch out for those that are challenging your convictions. We're living in a time where having convictions are a bad thing. Can I tell you? Uh uh-uh. uh. The Bible actually tells us it's a sin to sin against our consciences. If you have a strong, godly conviction about something, don't let a slimy little serpent tell you otherwise. He's deceiving her. He's doing it with deception and lies. Now look at what the apostle Paul does when he references this story while he's writing to the Corinthian church, encouraging them to beware of these false teachers. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, he says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. He says that the serpent was cunning. What is cunning? Having or showing skill in achieving one's end by deceit or evasion. The enemy is skillful in deceiving. He's been doing it for a very long time. His deception leads to death. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came, and this is good news for somebody in the room. I came, Jesus came, that I may have life and ha- that you may have life and have it abundantly. Don't be surprised when you come in contact with the skillful deceiver whose end goal is to try to lead you astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Your relationship with Jesus matters. You have to guard your minds from lies and deceit because your devotion matters. Being fully devoted, not half-heartedly devoted. Not having one foot in and one foot out, but being fully invested, fully committed, fully engaged. Being half-heartedly devoted gives, it opens the door for doubt. And it gives doubt the opportunity to creep into your thoughts. That ever happened to someone in the room? You were so certain about something for some time and then doubt began to creep in and it just shook your world. The half-hearted devotion points to a double-minded person. And this is what James has to say about the double-minded person. He says the double-minded person is unstable in all of his ways. So how do you guard it? You do what Jesus did. In Matthew chapter 4, right before Jesus launches into his ministry for three years, he goes on this fast for 40 days and 40 nights before he's fully launched into his ministry. At the end of his fast, when he's hungry... Guess who shows up in the desert? The same old slimy little serpent. The skillful, the skillful deceiver. He shows up and tries to do to Jesus the very thing he did to Eve. He tried to get Jesus to forfeit everything God had planned for the world. He tempts him with food, tempts him with his identity, tempts him with power and glory. And here's what Jesus did. He identified the lie by speaking the truth found in God's word, and then he resisted the devil. So how do you guard your mind from lies? You identify the lie, you speak the truth, and you resist the devil. Identify the lie, you speak the truth, you resist the devil. Identify the lie, you speak the truth, resist the devil. Say it with me. Identify the lie. Oh, oh, nobody's lying to y'all? Identify the lie, speak the truth, resist the devil. Here's why it's a good thing, because then we get a promise from God. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourself, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you you. Take care of your mind with prayer. At New City Church, we have these staff and leadership values, and I love, I love the way that Pastor Steve wrote this. It says this, you can put the next slide up, prayerlessness is pride. To serve God's people and be effective leaders, we seek the heart of God in all things. 
We bear one another's burdens, choose joy, and trust God for every need in our lives and in our church. And prayer is how we express that. This is why we have a monthly prayer meeting, because prayerlessness is pride. We know we can't do it on our own strength. We know we're not creative enough to figure it out uh, here on this side of heaven. We know that we need to seek the Lord. A person who doesn't pray is a person doing everything that they do on their own strength. And here's the thing about doing things in your own strength. You get to, your, you get to the point where your strength runs out. You have no more to give. But when you're able to tap back into the source of strength, which is God, God is able to restore, replenish, and refill you. We have too many Christians walking around with their tank on empty, but they're still refusing to spend time with the Lord to be renewed, refilled, restored. The psalmist said, restore to me the joy of your salvation. That was prayer language. A man that felt empty, a man that felt numb, a man that felt that he lost something, took time to pray to God and tell him the truth. God, I don't feel it anymore. Would you do something in me supernatural? Would you refill me again? Would you speak to me? Would you remind me of your promises? It's in God's presence when we're made new, when we're restored and refilled. There are people that feel burnt out. This term is, I've never heard this term being used so much in my life like it is being used right now. And I'm not saying you can't set healthy boundaries. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that sometimes I don't feel like we're reaching our full potential because we forget that God has more to give us. We settle for what we can do. We settle for where we have to stop. And God is saying, I have so much more to give you. You're living on yesterday's Bible verse. I got new messages for you. I got truth for you to think about. I have restoration for you. You still have that broken heart? Spend time with me. It's time to heal that broken heart. You, you, you're feeling burnt out? Spend time with me. I am able to give you ener the energy that you need. Oh, you're, you're a stay-at-home mom and, and, and it just feels like it's all getting out of hand. Well, God is saying, well, if you would just spend a little bit of time with me, you would be surprised that you're able to serve your kids with a different type of joy that only comes from the presence of God. It's important that we pray. But now back to our main subject today, the mind. Prayer is the antidote to worry. Anxiety is introduced to peace of mind when that mind finds itself praying and praying often. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. Now, for someone that struggles with anxiety from time to time, hello? I love this verse. It's a great reminder for me. I allow worries of the world, right, worries of the job, worries of, uh, of even church, right, to get to my mind. And, and then these anxious starts come to play. And then I'm reminded by this verse. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the Peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. A moment ago, we said that you have to guard your minds against lies. And now this verse is teaching us that we should guard our minds against worry and anxiety. Other places in the Bible, in the Gospels, it, Jesus talks about worry and anxiety being the seed, the, the thing that chokes out the seed that God's trying to plant in your heart. But then this verse says, don't be anxious about anything. Why does Paul have the audacity? He don't know my mental health. Paul was a single man. He didn't have no kids. He don't know what it's like. How does he have the audacity to say to not have anxiety or worry about anything? It's because his thoughts were never fixated on his situations. They were always fixated on the God that he serves. 
And when your thoughts are on things higher than you, when your thoughts are on the things of heaven, when your thoughts are, in, are, are on Jesus Christ, you realize there's nothing God can't do. You realize that the thing that worries you doesn't worry him. You realize the thing that's a mountain in your life is like a speck to the Lord. You realize the enemy that you're trying to defeat in this season is already defeated in the name of Jesus because of the victory that's made available, available to you through Jesus Christ. I want us to have that same audacity. What would your life look like if you had that same audacity, that same fervor, that same confidence, that same trust in your God? It would change the way you act, change the way you think. It would change your situation. Our prayer life points to trust. <laughs> the praying man, the praying woman is a man and a woman that understands their trust is in the right place. I'm not saying this to make someone feel bad. I'm going hard on this point because I've been there many times in my life. Here's the truth. If you're not praying, it is a symptom of you serving another God, serving another idol. Because we're creatures of habits and we love comfort. And so when we're uncomfortable, it is in our nature to run to the things that make us comfortable again. That's why we have addictions. That's why pornography is still a thing we got to talk about in the church. That's why drugs is a real thing. That's why people go back to even making people feel bad because maybe that makes them uncomfortable. That's why people go back to being unforgiving in their lives because at least they find comfort and control in that. So when you don't find yourself praying, it is a symptom that there's some idols in your life that you're bowing down to. And prayer, it's this spiritual weapon that we have. Think of it as like an ax. When you take things to pray, you are breaking these strongholds to the ground. So take care of your mind by holding every thought captive. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 to 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. What did we just talk about? But have divine power to destroy strongholds. Stop right there. These toxic thoughts, these dangerous thoughts, these sinful thoughts, those are strongholds. They may feel natural, but the Bible tells us that you're actually engaged in a supernatural war. That's why you could be making breakfast and this intrusive thought just pops into your head. That's why you could be reading your Bible and then be ready to say goodnight and then you can't sleep for the rest of the night because your mind is fixated on the things that you're worried about. It's spiritual warfare. But I thank God for verse 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Your negative thoughts, your toxic thoughts, your sinful thoughts, those are strongholds that have to bow to the king that you serve, Jesus. And I'm going to close here in a second. But it was about a year and change ago maybe. Um, I got three kids. My oldest son, his name is Maverick. And uh, Maverick was always a great sleeper. My man could sleep, man. Like, you put him down, it was like 7. My man was waking up at 8 p.m., um, 8 a.m. If it was 8 p.m., we had to check on him. That would have been bad. He was a great sleeper. And then about a year and some change ago, um, everything just changed. <laughs> everything changed. Um, he kept waking up in the middle of the night screaming, like hysterical. And um, what he was saying was, he was like, Mommy, Daddy, I'm scared of the octopus. I'm like, scared of the octopus? So, you know, we did what every parent would do. We got up and just, you know, hey, buddy, where, where's the octopus? Oh, no, there's no octopus in here. You're good, man. Let's, let's just, let's just you're, you're fine, man. Let's get back to bed. He's like, no, no, no. And then this continued. 
continue the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the next week. This octopus was ruining my life. <laughs> I never hated an animal so much in my life. I'm like, I'm like, my wife and I got together. We started praying. It was affecting our sleep. We got no sleep for like a long time. We're like, man, God, I rebuke this demonic octopus in the name of of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one that was born of the Virgin Mary. I was going so hard. Because I want the enemy to know what Jesus I'm talking about. There's a lot of people that, I say I'm about to go down a rabbit trail. Let me stay, let me stay put. And so, thank God for a Holy Spirit filled wife. She's like, babe, I think we have to teach Maverick scripture. Because what Maverick doesn't know is that from time to time, my wife and I, for some reason, we have bad dreams that affect our sleep. And the way that we were taught to combat that is with the word of God and with prayer. So we came to Maverick and we said, hey, buddy, um, when you wake up in the middle of the night afraid of this octopus, you have to understand something. Jesus is with you and he loves you and he's going to protect you. I was talking to my son, but I'm talking to y'all too. Jesus is with you and he's gonna protect you. It don't matter what the scary thing is in your life. He loves you, you're not alone, he's with you. So then we said, hey Mav, um, can you repeat this verse for me? 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So we started to say that to him every day. And Maverick is really good at memorizing things. And so the next night happened and he started to cry. Daddy, mommy, I'm scared of the octopus. So we went upstairs and we said, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna pray? We're gonna pray, so we prayed. What's the verse, Maverick? For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of a power of love and a sound mind. Okay, but let's get back to sleep. The next day happened, woke up again. Daddy, I'm scared of the octopus. And as a parent, I have to be honest, it's a bit discouraging. Right? Because you're like, God, we're doing what you're telling us to do. We're, 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 we're practicing what we're preaching. We're, we're, we're doing this, and my son still can't get no rest, and which I don't know is that that was affecting the way he was at school. It was affecting the way he behaved during the day. He was, he just, he was so unrested and unsettled. So, so now we're, we're, we're going to war in our prayer closet while he's praying himself, and then another night happened, and I can't even tell you which night it was, but we're watching, we're watching TV downstairs, and then it's probably like 11 p.m. and he opens up the door and he's like, mommy, daddy, I'm scared of the octopus. But then there was a but, but Jesus loves me and he's with me and he's gonna protect me. And then he says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. My man closed the door and went back to bed, never had another bad dream again. Every head bowed, every eye closed in this place. Do not be conformed. Do not be tethered to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Salvation is a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit that brings you from death to life. And one day we'll get to heaven and we'll be able to ask God how he does it. But here's what I'm confident in saying. Conversion also points to God renewing your mind, changing the way that you think. In a moment, I want to pray for those that want to put their faith in Jesus for the first time. But before we get there, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you a question today. What are the thoughts that are ruining your life? What are the intrusive thoughts? What are the thoughts that are telling you you're not good enough? You should be a better parent. The business is going to fail because of your leadership. 
You'll never be able to break from pornography. You'll never be able to stop smoking, stop drinking. What are those intrusive thoughts? Holy Spirit, give us strength today. Give us courage today. Take a moment to identify the lie. For me, I always struggle with thoughts of inadequacy. And I have to remind myself that if God called me to something, it's because it's not up to me, it's up to him. If God has put you in a place to be a parent, then you have all that you need. If God told you to start that business, then he'll give you the tools you need for, 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 for it to be successful. What are these thoughts? For some it may be, oh, I feel like I'm going to fail school. I feel like I can't get good grades. Identify the lie. Come on, in this moment, nobody's looking around. Just take a moment to start to speak truth to the lie. I am a child of God called by him. He's with me. He loves me. He will protect me. Come on, out of your own lips to God's ear, you don't got to scream it. You can whisper it. You can say, God, you are with me. I will not believe the lies that I bought into in the past. I know that you're with me and you are for me. And if you're for me, what can stand against me? I am a child of the living God. He is not leaving me alone. I have a community of people that I can even tap into today. For some, the lie may be that sin was like the hundredth time you did it. God is ashamed of you. Speak truth to that lie in the name of Jesus today. Because of what Jesus did on the cross over 2,000 years ago. He died for your sins yesterday, today, and forevermore. There is a supernatural type of patience and love that God has that we cannot begin to understand. So the reality is because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, you are not on a spiritual timeout. He is not ashamed of you. He is not mad at you. He deeply, deeply loves you. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. You're in this room today, and you'll say, I've been living my life out of my own strength, and my strength is run out. I need to put my trust and my faith in this person to Jesus. The one that came and lived the perfect life, the life I couldn't live, and died a death that I deserved so I can have life, like he said, and have it abundantly. God wants to meet with you today, my brother and my sister. He's saying, welcome to the family. If that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus, I just simply want to pray for you. Can you lift up one hand and you could put it right back down? Just lift up a hand and put it down. I see you. I see you. Come on, one more moment. You want to put your trust in Jesus today. I see you. Church, can we pray this prayer together? Actually, I'm going to ask everyone to stand to their feet. Come on, those three hands that went up. Can we praise God for the three hands that are about to make that decision, that are making that decision right now? Come on, every, every eye closed in this place. If you raise your hand, we're going to have a team up here in a moment just ready to pray for some people. And maybe if today's message resonated with you in any way, you, you, you need prayer, you, you need somebody to just intercede on your behalf. We have people to do that for you. But if you raise your hand, I'm going to lead you through this prayer, a prayer of confession of you saying, God, you are my savior today. So with every eye closed, repeat after me, church. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, you took my shame, you took my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me, so I wouldn't have to. Today, I turn from my sins to be made new. God is my Father, Jesus is my Savior, the Holy Spirit is my Helper, 
and heaven is my home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. Church, can we give God praise one more time?